stomach is down. Good afternoon, everybody. This is Florent St. Clair with DICOM Systems. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we're going to wait until more of our attendees have joined the webinar, and then we'll get started. We will be on mute until we actually start. Thank you. Okay, everybody, I think uh, we have uh, quite a few of our audience uh, logged in. And so we're going to get started. Again, this is Florent St. Clair. I'm the Executive Vice President for DICOM Systems, and I'll be your moderator for this webinar. I would like to introduce our co presenters, uh, Mr. Manabu Tokunaga, joining us from Santa Cruz, California. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, as well as Dr. Nolan. Altman, who's the chairman of radiology at uh, Nicholas Children's Hospital in Miami. Uh, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. We very much appreciate your time and look forward to a lively discussion on the integration of uh, visible light imaging and photography in the world of enterprise imaging. Uh, let's uh, get started, please. Uh, next slide. So as far as um, audience engagement, uh, what I'd like to make sure is that you are aware of the Q&A window uh, to ask you questions. We will be compiling the questions along the way. We'll be sending them to our panelists to make sure that we uh, answer as many of the questions as possible. Uh, but uh, those uh, questions can be sent privately and you have a Q&A uh, window that you can use to submit your questions. So please uh, be sure to do that. We will be reserving a pretty good chunk of time towards the end of the presentation to make sure we answer your questions. Next slide, please. So um, the context for the conversation today is a really well-admired hospital in Miami. Uh, I can't say enough good things about Nicholas Children's Hospital and how innovative and how uh, creative uh, they have been in uh, you know the care that they place into the utilization of technology to advance patients health uh, especially children right uh, they're focused on uh, pediatrics and so uh, some of the most interesting you know innovations we've done as a company as Dicom systems uh, have involved Nicholas children's because they do push the envelope pretty routinely um, we were fortunate to be introduced to Nicholas Children's by our partners uh, at Cerner. Uh, you know, Cerner is a company that is uh, completely immersed and uh, committed to the world of interoperability. And so their commitment to interoperability is what's allowed us to uh, do some wonders uh, in some of the clinical contexts that are typically 
closed off uh, to other vendors. And so um, this has been um, thanks to uh, the, the, the Chief Nursing Information Officer, Elise Hermes, is, uh, has been a wonderful advocate for this platform. And of course, uh, the Enterprise IT Manager, Mr. Milton Sanchez, um, hopefully he's been able to join us uh, today. And of course, the uh, leadership and stewardship of uh, Dr. Altman uh, in the adoption of this platform to advance uh, some of the clinical workflows we're gonna be looking at today. Um, next slide. So really briefly about the backdrop on the technology side, DICOM Systems is pretty well known as sort of the plumber of the industry. We're not typically visible to the physician side of the enterprise. Um, we leave that to the PAX companies, the VNA companies, uh, the people that do enterprise viewers, and of course, EHRs. Um, so our typical customer at DICOM Systems is going to be your PAX admins, your network admins, your directors of IT, your CIO, you know, people that are concerned with the enterprise infrastructure that's serving up the images for the physicians. And so in our experience, past 11 years, DICOM Systems is now uh, pretty routinely running about 9 billion images through our systems um, annually. Uh, some of our largest installations do as many as 5,000 daily uh, commits of uh, exams to our, uh, to our archives. Uh, we also power about 12 million annual Telerad reads, uh, which is not counting relevant priors on top of that number. And we've also increasingly gotten involved in uh, workflows that are involving uh, machine learning. And so some of the largest that we've done and had um, as many as five and a half million exams that needed to be de-identified scientifically uh, to be able to be used uh, to feed into a machine learning algorithm to learn new things. And so using this platform and essentially using it as um, you know, kind of a universal adapter uh, has allowed us to essentially plug in the Zen Snap app that we're going to be spending our time on today, uh, along with Dr. Altman and, and uh, Manabu Tokunaga. So this interoperability layer plugs into Cerner and plugs into virtually any enterprise imaging node that needs to talk to um, other nodes. And that could be HL7, it could be Fire, it could be DICOM, um, the interoperability layer is the DICOM Systems Unifier platform. So next slide, please. So uh, one of the most important things to consider uh, in this conversation is the role of mobile uh, devices in today's hospital context. It, it, it's kind of impossible to turn back the clock, right? All of us, physicians included, are using smartphones for virtually everything and professional purposes. Uh, so uh, what, you, what you find today is, you know, physicians are extremely resourceful individuals, and it doesn't matter if a hospital has sanctioned uh, um, a method of communication uh, or not, they're going to do whatever is best for their patient. And even if that includes um, utilizing a mobile device that doesn't belong to the hospital. And so, you know, everybody knows that happens every day. And so that's one of the key problems that we solve. Uh, with this platform. Uh, please go to the next slide. So here are some of the issues that are layered on top of the CIO's head every day, right? These are some of the issues that, um, that, that plague uh, not just enterprise imaging, but also every department that uses imaging one way or the other. So number one, unauthorized and unsecured personal mobile devices. That means iPads, that means iPhones, it means Android devices. These are all devices that belong typically to the individual using it. Uh, and in some cases, believe it or not, even with all the HIPAA uh, education that goes on every day, a lot of people still use email or text or you know, unsanctioned uh, methodology to share images with one another. Another key issue for the same end users, especially the IT department, is that those mobile devices have zero enterprise integration. So the ability to utilize some of the EHR functionality or the PAX functionality is cut off from the, or siloed away from the ability to use your mobile devices, typically. Um, another issue is that, especially in a pediatric environment, the care team that's caring for a patient could include as many as 50 different people 
that all have a different reason to interact with the patient's data. So it's very cumbersome to collaborate when you're tied to a desktop to do something in the EHR if you're trying to do something with a patient in a room. Um, and another issue is that um, because you're, you're, you're tied to your desktop in order to make any changes in your EHR, going to the patient to take a, a photo might involve some other device like a Nikon, Nikon camera or you know, some other device that the hospital may have sanctioned. And now you need to find a way to take those images taken in a, in a, in a, uh, uh, a Nikon camera and transfer that and dichromize that and make that a part of the enterprise imaging environment. So you, you take the uh, accumulation of all these layers of complexity and you can see how you using enterprise uh, uh, imaging for a mobile device can be a challenge. Uh, next slide, please. So some of the most important things we can be thinking about is, you know, how do we in fact make this a painless and seamless integration in an environment where everybody wants to use mobile devices, but it's, a non it, it's not a controlled environment that they're doing it in. And so one of the, one of the key layers is the existing infrastructure. Uh, most hospitals have you know, LDAP or Active Directory. They have a PACS, they have an EHR. In this case, Cerner is both the EHR and the PACS at Nicholas Children's. And so if you're gonna be doing mobile device uh, you know, type of imaging, you need to be able to fit snugly within the existing environment. You don't want to have to completely reinvent the infrastructure. The hospital has, has already invested a lot of capital in the acquisition and customization of the EHR and the PACS. So to accommodate mobile devices, we have to be unobtrusive. We have to be benign uh, in the impact to the existing infrastructure. Um, reducing human error is a key, right? So the ability to use the Accomodality work list has typically not been available to mobile devices because uh, uh, an iPhone or an iPad is not a typical modality that's communicating via work list uh, to a RIS or a PAX. And so we need to be able to um, reduce human error uh, and data entry into a mobile device by giving the mobile device access to a work list. And then uh, another key aspect of this platform, and, and Manabu will, will speak to this uh, at uh, greater length, is that because these devices are readily available in iTunes, right? You can download the app from iTunes today uh, for free. Uh, this is leveraging an app that is very natural for people to learn, right? So there's virtually no end user adoption. We started in radiology, but adoption is now per pervasive throughout the hospital and users in other departments like plastic surgery, uh, you know, any other department that that could be using this now wants to because it's such a natural tool set to use uh, with no training. So um, this is also sanctioned by the hospital. So the CIO doesn't have to think twice about it. The, the fleet of devices is now uh, belonging to the hospital, right? The iPads were purchased by the hospital and deployed to the physicians and the technologists to do their job with. And so security and compliance are taken care of because these are tools that are being given to the physicians and the caregivers by the hospital. Another interesting part is uh, you, you don't just view visible light images in a mobile device, you can actually view any type of modality um, that is now available through the integration with um, the PACS. And so by, by leveraging uh, DICOM Web as a standard, WADO RS, Keto RS, STO RS, all of those standards that are uh, deployed through the DICOM systems unifier are available through this user interface. So I, I'd like to uh, give the mic to Manabu to speak to this um, a little bit. Go ahead, Manabu. Yes, thank you very much, Florent, and thank you very much, everybody, for joining us today. Um, yeah, so um, just quickly introduce myself. So I have been in this kind of industry for a long time, starting from uh, designing a CT scanner to uh, working in an ultrasound company, Akison. And then um, we started the company called Stentor, which we sold to Philips, which is the PAX. That's how um, I got into the PAX business. And um, so, so, but throughout all this um, time, uh, there are two key themes that we have, I was always asked to solve, which is, how I can save time 
and how can accu how can I accurately deliver what I have acquired and how I can communi accurately uh, communicate what I've seen to other people. So two things. Now the mobile communication uh, came, which is really the perfect to address this first save time and accuracy part and um, the security part coming. So, um, so that's how um, I've been making an effort to develop this into a um, completely cohesive package that can be used in the um, clinical situations. And uh, down the line, um, we're also starting to add the patient engagement part to it, which would make it very easy for the patient to also provide information or from the clinical side to provide information. Of course, pretty much most people have Android or iPhone. So um, this will be a very perfect platform now to address all these three issues. So um, next slide, please. Um, so what people wanted to do is in a clinical setting is that people come in right now in the morning and um, have a uh, conference, uh, round conference, and then talk up that they talk about the cases. But um, what they want to do is to actually that communication to continue throughout the day. And um, that's the core of this uh, application. So Manabu, let me, yeah. let me ask you about this and actually bring Dr. Altman into the conversation as well. Yeah, let's do that. This, this is really the crux of our conversation here and the innovation. Uh, and so one of the first questions that I asked when, when we started discussing this project with Nicholas Children's is, you know, why in the heck would radiology need photography in the practice of uh, diagnostics, right? Because radiology, as we know it in this business, uses ultrasound, MR, nuke med, you know, they use internal medical imaging to, uh, to articulate a diagnosis. And so that was my first question because, you know, not really being familiar with the, the really unique workflows that Dr. Altman and his team have at Nicholas Children's. Uh, that was kind of my naive question. Why do you need photography? And it became really clear. I had kind of a light bulb moment when we were all sitting in the same room together at clinical conference at 8 a.m. I'm sorry, um, uh, at 7 a.m. Yeah. We ended at 8 a.m., right? <laughs> so um, I, I finally saw why, right? So you have a radiology workstation. You have a PAX. Uh, uh, you have medical images up, open on the desktop, and you have uh, you're projecting images on the wall and side by side you now have all of these physicians that are collaborating on problematic cases um, that are able to see not just the internal images that they need to discuss uh, and next steps in the care for the patient but also the outward manifestation of a um, of uh, symptoms so taking a picture of the patient taking a picture of the skin uh, in addition to showing the medical images, provide, uh, you know, not just a very effective, holistic approach to uh, collaborating in that, in that room, but it, it's also a very effective teaching tool, right? Because Nicholas Children's is also a very large teaching program with a lot of residents. And so what was really interesting to us to witness this is to see how our technology was being deployed in a very innovative way in clinical conference but the collaboration cannot end at 8 a.m. And it typically does. Any tumor board, any you know, clinical conference, you know, people get together for an hour or 45 minutes in the morning and the, the collaboration is typically very effective because they're all in the same room in the same context looking at the same information. And then everybody at 8 a.m. gets up, they go to do their job at different floors, uh, they attend to their patients, and the, the collaboration that was so good for an hour get stopped dead in its tracks at 8 a.m. And so what we now see using this platform is that the collaboration continues throughout the day. It's almost like you have a Twitter feed on each patient case that was discussed during clinical conference. And that uh, Twitter feed, if I may, right, it's not Twitter, it's, it's the ZenSnap app in which they are collaborating. But that, that effective collaboration that took place in the morning 
continues throughout the day as the patients continue to evolve. Yeah, uh, and then what uh, Dr. Altman will show in the moment, um, he would, um, you actually get the taste of that today. So um, you can walk back and with this and with a mobile use of it. I think so Dr. Altman, this would be an interesting point for you to bring to the audience is, you know, you've probably had the desire to bring in visible light images all along for a long time, and you may have been doing it already, but, you know, tell us a little bit more about that. Okay, well, thank you very much, Florent, and it's glad, I'm glad uh, to be part of this uh, program because uh, I've had the privilege to work with Florent since 19... Uh, since 2016, uh, and we're glad to have you under the hood as far as our uh, DICOM uh, collaboration to allow us to do many things uh, that Cerner wouldn't quite allow us to do uh, through your intricate uh, rules engine. Uh, and then uh, this new endeavor uh, with Manabu that allows us, like uh, you were alluding to, to um, do things that we have been doing for some time, besides our uh, daily 7 a.m. Uh, uh, meetings that we have with the residents and the attendings. And uh, we have those in the different disciplines uh, in our department uh, to help uh, everyone stay on the same page. But as you all said, communication is key and accurate communication that's quick is even better. So uh, I think that all of us realize that our communicator device uh, is, the, uh, is our, our cell phone. And that's where everything really is uh, residing. I think that uh, for quite some time, I've been using myself, my personal cell phone, uh, which I continue to do, as well as all of the residents and most of the attendings to communicate a lot of different things regarding uh, imaging. And from the resident shooting uh, iPhone picture off of the PAX workstation to me at home, to the other attendings within the hospital shooting me pictures of cases that they may see at other hospitals, everything ends up at residing in the iPhone. So what you all have allowed us to do is to, to uh, basically um, do this the proper way by having the ability for us off of our DICOM integrated PACS um, work list be able to have in the same um, folder images from not only the uh, patient's uh, parents from their iPhone, uh, from the technologist uh, doing the imaging, uh, it all can reside in the patient's work list and we can see it quickly and share it with our other colleagues. And that's kind of what I wanna show. For us, uh, we've been doing for quite some time documentation of the patient's skin uh, over the areas of concern and I'll show some cases anywhere from along the patient's spine to see if there's underlying neurocutaneous disorders to um, patients that have interventional procedures. And once we see the lesion, once the technologist can see the lesion, um, we not only at the hospital, but we have 12 satellite centers where we have ultrasound exams being done. And some, so not only do we get the ultrasound images, and some of our satellites have MR images, but we get the clinical pictures and we can put them all together uh, as another pulse sequence, uh, say in the case of, uh, of uh, MR images, we just drop it all into the PAC system and we can see all of the images of the patient at one time. So Dr. Altman, there, there's actually a, an important distinction in the way that images get created between a mobile device versus an ultrasound, right? So ultrasound, CT, MR, NUCMED, all of those devices typically use something called a dichromodality work list in order to know what's next, right? Who's the next patient and get the proper demographics from the EHR uh, automatically populated in the DICOM headers. 
it's a little bit different when you're dealing with a mobile device. And so historically, uh, when you were using a mobile device, you didn't really have a place to put metadata into the images. And so you would have orphan images that would have to be manually handled, dichomized, and then placed into the packs. Um, and so, but, but that also means that you have a different kind of workflow that doesn't involve work list, and that's called an encounter-based uh, imaging event. And so encounter-based versus, uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, encounter-based imaging is a totally different sport, uh, and, but it can utilize the same underlying infrastructure to provide work list in order to reduce human error uh, in data entry, right? In, a, in an iPhone with fat fingers, it would be very easy to, easy to introduce uh, typos in the patient's name or in various things. And so by providing work list to an iPad or an iPhone um, as if it were any other conventional imaging equipment in the hospital, you dramatically reduce the amount of time that it takes to not just begin an encounter, but also make it ingestible by the PACS and available to the rest of the enterprise, uh, you know, through the PACS viewer. Uh, so um, those, those two different types of workflows are interesting to discuss. So I'll let you talk about that. Uh, me or? <laughs> no, uh, well, either one of you. Can, you know, yeah, so you let me just, uh, yeah, quickly tell you. So, um, You'll be hearing or you have been hearing about IHE um, um, encounter-based workflow. And Nicholas Children is one of the earlier places they're going to be able to do this, mainly because the flexibility of the DICOM system unifier. And um, essentially, for me, as a ZenSnap user, we just look, look at it as if it's a DICOM modality work list. The uh, system, a uh, DICOM unifier will get the, all, all these uh, encounter events like ADT events, um, as well as the radiology events, and um, will make it look work the same way. You look, look for the patient and take the photo, and it will just route it to the right place, either on your um, power charts um, folder or to the DICOM uh, part of the pulse sequence or the, the uh, series actually in the DICOM series in the image. So um, this is gonna be very, very flexible solution. Um, and it's not just a mobile photo capture. We do a lot of this kind of work. Um, and then we integrate it with other AI stuff that's uh, in the behind the scenes. So um, make the context available uh, much easier and sooner sort of things. Um, okay. Yeah. So. Um, and also secondary captures, uh, you know, because your device, your app uh, can leverage OCR, you yes. can take a picture of a document and OCR will be able to make that document searchable in your mobile device. Yeah. Uh, the, Not only searchable, but we can match that with MRN. We can locate MRN, accession number, order number, that yeah. sort of things. Yeah. And then another interesting thing that um, Nicholas Children's pointed out is that, you know, they do still own all those Nikon uh, cameras, right? Conventional photography uh, equipment that they still use occasionally. And so there's like a, I think you can go to Amazon and buy a $40 Bluetooth adapter for the Nikon camera and actually connect it to the iPad and take pictures with that conventional camera and still make it available through the same mechanism. Yeah, Florent, and not only that, um, you can add an otoscope, you can do a fundoscope, um, my, even a microscope, it can be added on your iPhone, just an attachment, and you should, you'll be able to do much wider range of uh, photo, photo um, acquisition. It's all backed by the modality works, all end up in the right place, right patient, right chart. Yes. Right. So I wanna just, jump in here and thank both of you again for staying under the hood yep. because as because as the end user um i think it's very important that we have it all organized but we just want to see it quickly and we want to see it accurately and that's what you've allowed us to do and i think that while we've had many devices that we can use and continue to use um, i think that the common work list and the applications of your rules engine to allow us to do that uh, is what's really 
pushing forward uh, this product. Hopefully we'll see it in the near future. And um, some of this we've already started to use. Next slide, please. So we'll leave the floor now to the physician in the room. Uh, Dr. Altman, these are the cases that you, that you leverage these technology for. So let's talk about the human element here. So right, this is a little girl that was seen in an outside imaging center and she has these different spots on her scalp. And so the technologist knows that if there's any patient that has a lump or a bump, uh, that she needs to take a picture of it for us so we know what we're looking at. Um, and I think that it also lends a human nature to our clinical work as as radiologists, a lot of people think that we're doctors, doctors, and we're just in a little box uh, with no windows looking at images all day. But indeed, we still are physicians. And I think that this really helps us uh, to get the complete picture of our patient. So this little girl has these little spots on her scalp and uh, they're red and they're raised. And we can see that quickly and cleanly uh, with this picture that the technologist at the satellite center has taken of this little girl that came in and she sent it with um, the ultrasound picture next. And here's the ultrasound that was done and you can see this is on your left side a grayscale ultrasound and on the right side this is a, uh, a, uh, a color uh, Doppler study of the uh, same area. And you can see there's a lot of color in here and we know that as radiologists that this indicates it's a vascular malformation. There's different types of vascular malformations that you can see and uh, there's venous malformations, there's hemangiomas, but with the picture of the child we know for sure that this is a hemangioma and there's nothing to do about these things. They'll go away and we can tell the mom and dad before they leave the imaging area that this is what it is and you don't have to worry about it. Next. Now, another patient comes in and has a little lump, as you can see here on the skin. And uh, we then uh, had the technologist, this again was an ultrasound, do the ultrasound picture and send it to us. Um, you, you look at that image, it's, um, it looks a little blurred here, but uh, you can see this lump and it has a yellow discoloration surrounded by a red. Uh, and then on the ultrasound next, Uh, <clears throat> this is an offset, so this is the skin, and this is again the color, and this is the grayscale images of this lump. And uh, it looks kind of like the last one, that it's vascular, but when we see the clinical image and we compare it with this color ultrasound image, which may look the same as that hemangioma, we know in an instant that this isn't. This is an infection. It's an abscess, it needs to be drained. And we then went on to do IR, interventional radiology and drain the abscess on this baby. Next. So here's a boy that comes in and he has, don't see it that well on the picture, but he has a bit of a lump along the side of his jaw. And uh, we uh, then had the ultrasound done, uh, next. Well, we did an x-ray, sorry, uh, a little out of order. The x-ray doesn't really help us at all. Uh, we, <clears throat> we did the x-ray to make sure it wasn't a bone lesion, which we didn't see. Next. And then we actually got a CT and you can see there's a little soft tissue swelling here, but this, you see this uh, lesion that's under his jawbone. So when we saw that, we then went ahead and did an ultrasound. And here, as opposed to the last two cases that I showed you, we see that there is a lump here. It shows this uh, on the grayscale that it's relatively hypoechoic, but it has no vascular pattern to it. So, um, so we know that this is not a vascular lesion, but the, we weren't quite sure what it was. There are some lesions uh, such as cysts uh, uh, and or other low flow uh, lesions that this can possibly be, but um, there's certain cysts, and this looks more like a cystic structure. So, um, the, but the question always is, could this be uh, a tumor? Uh, is this a cyst, uh, either a congenital cyst or an acquired cyst? And uh, 
So in this case, we did go on and do a um, ultrasound guided uh, needle aspiration. Uh, so we turned it over to the uh, interventional radiologist. And once we did that, we can document that, which we did. And we can do this all seamlessly within our system uh, that, uh, that you all have helped develop uh, with us. And so we actually have document of the aspirate that we retrieved. And when we looked at this, it's mucus material. And so we know cleanly uh, what this is. It's called a ranula. And it's a, a uh, obstruction of the uh, um, of a duct and it fills up with mucus. Uh, it's actually an obstruction of the sublingual uh, duct. And um, we can then safely go and refer this to our uh, ENT colleagues to have it removed. Uh, the reason we do this is there's other things such a lymphatic malformation where we would then go in directly after we do the aspirate and fill it with a sclerosant material and obliterate it that way. So this helps us to determine not only what the lesion is, but how to treat it. Next. So one further case that we did, and uh, we do this in all of our patients, as I alluded to, where if there is a um, concern of a lesion along the back, and this just to orient you is this is the patient's back and this is the gluteal fold here. So there's a little pit uh, that you can see here along the midline of the spine. So it's very important when we see things like this to document it because not only can you have a little pit along the midline, but you can have skin discoloration. And when you have things like this, particularly if the pit here is outside of the gluteal fold, you have to be worried that there could be some underlying spine and or cord, spinal cord abnormality. So we went ahead and did an ultrasound, next. And here's the ultrasound picture. Just to orient you all, this is posterior and this is anterior. We've labeled the vertebra and what we have here is you can see clearly that there is this sac which goes down all the way down to the sacral area. So this would be towards the patient's feet. This would be towards the patient's head. And this is actually the spinal cord that you can see. But as the children get older, you get this bounce from the ultrasound beam. Uh, so you don't see so clearly, but it did look like the cord was extending too low. So we followed that up with an MRI next. And here now towards the patient's head, towards the patient's feet. This is anterior, posterior. What you see here is the cord is too low. Uh, the cord should end normally in, in all of us at the L1, L2 level. And this extends actually below the L2 level. And this indicates that the cord is too low and the neurosurgeon will have to go in and he'll clip this little, little what we call the phylum terminal, which is pulling the cord down too low to make sure the kid doesn't end up with a interning foot or some kind of other uh, neurologic defect that you uh, don't want to end up with and can't correct once it's occurred. So we try and do this before it occurs. And uh, this is a tethered cord uh, as uh, indicated from actually the clinical pictures of the little dimple outside of the gluteal crease. So these are just a few examples of how, yes, as a radiologist that sits in a box. We actually like to see our patients. We like to document what we see with our patients. And we, it helps us not only to diagnose, but it also helps us to treat, as I showed you in the interventional cases. Yeah, it's also great for teaching purposes as well too, right, Dr. Altman? Uh, that's what we're here for. Yeah. And, and even more importantly, I mean, teaching is super important, but uh, the, the, the way that I see it, you know, as a parent, if, I, if my child is sick and I go to a hospital and, and, and the child goes through those doors and I have to wait for three hours without knowing what's going on, you know, when I do talk to a physician uh, who can then show me on an iPad what's actually happening with my child, the reality is in a, in a pediatric environment, the physicians and the nurses and the technologists, they don't just treat the infant or the child. They also, their patient are the parents. 
right? The parents are the ones making the decisions for their kids. And so uh, these tools, these communication tools, make it very effective for Dr. Altman and his team to communicate to the parents what's happening to their child. So uh, this concludes the um, demonstration uh, part of this uh, webinar. And what I would like to do is uh, explore what types of questions uh, might have been coming in. Um, and uh, we have our director of marketing, Taylor, who's uh, now taking a look at that. Uh, Taylor, what kind of questions should we be um, fielding at this point? Okay. We don't have any questions yet, um, but uh, you know, feel free to send them to us. Um, you know, we we do have you know quite a few aspects of this technology that were discussed today, not just on the clinical side, but also on the IT side, the security side, um, all of which can present uh, some interesting points of discussion. Uh, one area that we didn't discuss very much in detail that I would like. Uh, put, uh, Manabu to go more into hmm. is the AI possibilities uh, presented by this technology. Go ahead, Manabu. Yes. So um, next uh, couple of phases that um, we are going to, uh, one is, of course, the uh, wet reads, which is actually we are going to integrate the um, DICOM systems um, web-based radiology viewer directly into the app since we already have the context of which patient uh, you're looking at, um, you know, it would be easy to actually show all of the radi relevant radiology images. Um, this also have additional um, benefit in the sense that um, sometimes um, you may have a PAX downtime or for whatever reasons you cannot access the PAX, in which case you could use this as a backup mechanism to look at the images uh, as they're acquired. We are going to show the images as they hit the uh, DICOM system server, which is the first stage. So um, we can do that. Of course, we uh, pull the priors too for the given patient. Um, annotation on screen, you already have seen. Um, and so you can actually you know, draw um, arrows and stuff like that um, or circles, um, which of course you are familiar with. Um, we also have a patent, patented uh, size measurement algorithm so that with the aid of a um, uh, specifically coded ruler, you'll be able to actually measure size of the uh, actual object. It's really great for wound care. I know that some detailed wound care um, uses, uh, you have more detailed um, 3D type equipment, but essentially you can turn your iPhone, iPhone or iPad uh, into a viable measuring size measuring device at, at the kind of price point you know you pay for them so that's really great on um, facial AI um, we are actually going to um, do the um, looking at the various faces and you know when you walk into the doctor's office many doctors can tell you immediately right away what's wrong with you know the um, patient and so we're gonna bring that excitement <laughs> in, in terms of in AI so that you know that uh, photo by taking the photo you can tell what the patient might potentially have to, so aid in triaging we are going to not going to be a diagnosis uh, stuff um, and then we have a alexa ai technology which is essentially um, you actually can talk or using our chat mechanism you can just talk to the um a, uh, uh, to the engine and then engine can answer like what the blood cell count is the lab complete um, is infection indicated? You can just ask question rather than you going into uh, you know the uh, EHR and trying to find information. But, but so, it's not yeah. actually it's not actually Alexa, right? It's it's Alexa like, but it's correct, not. correct. Yeah, so um, it's easier to explain me that way when I'm pitching. So um, I use that terminology, but it could be Alexa, Siri. You know, um, it's a voice based natural language processing of um, smart processing of the voice plus the smart. Pro processing yeah. the text that's in a report. Yeah, so it's a yeah. lot of exciting things that Nicola Children is getting. So um, by next year, we're gonna come back to do this again. I have a lot more to show, yeah. So uh, interesting use cases. We did get a couple of questions, by the way. We'll go through them in a minute. But um, uh, one interesting project that Nicholas Children's that, uh, that you completed was that you also have a lot of historic pictures 
that were taken by various physicians, including in plastic surgery, uh, you know, in reconstructive surgery, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, the ability to uh, dichomize and you know process those, categorize them, and place them in a uh, metadata-rich environment uh, is also important, right? It's not just yes. Uh, as time goes forward, when you have this new app, you can now use it, but there's also a lot of historic images that that can be handled through this platform. And so you utilize some interesting categorization AI to to look through those historic images. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So uh, imagine that your parents one day give you a box full of just loose photos and then um, this is for you. Um, You do whatever you want to do with it. Now you want to put an album and, you know, put them. So our plastic surgeon at Nico Children's gave us equivalent of that. Uh, and then the, my task was to put them in the right place. Um, there are some clues as to, because it's a digital image, of course, so when and where, and, you know, thanks for the GPS, we can even tell you which clinic they are using. Um, but essentially uh, with that, and they, luckily also they took the picture of the chart. So um, I can OCR it and then fish out the information. So um, we kind of got about 90% accurate um, accuracy in actually sorting out the images. So they were threatening the, uh, you know, the residents to do all this sorting act, but you know, in just a matter of um, half an hour, we were able to um, sort out about 2000 images. Um, so, so that's actually a very interesting use of Microsoft um, cognition technology to do some of that stuff. Yeah, um, so if you have in the audience a bunch of loose photos that has to be done as a part of migration, do talk to us. We have the technology to help you with that. That's great. Um, so we did get a few questions. Uh, first one is, is it easy to use the app for users? And the, the answer is absolutely. And the reason is, you already know how to use it. It's, it's an iOS app. You can download it from iTunes. Uh, you can play with it. It's very intuitive. Um, you, know, you don't need to ask our permission to, to download it and play with it. You can, you can do that right now. Of course, you'll need to, uh, if you want to integrate it in your IT environment, we'll need to work with your IT group and make it you know, LDAP or AD integrated. But uh, you, you, you should feel free to do that right now. Just download the Zen Snap app uh, directly from iTunes. Yeah. Uh, we're, not, we're not yet available in uh, Android, and one of the reasons is that Android has not exactly been as secure in the past as a device. It's a little bit um, you know, unsecure from a healthcare and HIPAA perspective. It will get there. I think it's improving fast, but uh, today iOS is a much more uh, secure environment for medical images. And so we've been sticking to that for now. Um, go ahead, Manabu, you have a comment? Yeah, um, so as for Android, um, our web-based um, uh, portal can be used today. And then um, I'm going to add a simple, a little simpler photo acquisition mode that's completely work on a web browser. So um, Android users will st- start to get some benefit and use, use, uh, usability very shortly. That's great. Um, so let, we have a couple more questions here that came in. So how about secondary capture workflow, like ability to create images or scan document and attach to the existing studies? Absolutely, uh, that's a resounding yes. You can use the iPad or iPhone device to take a picture of a document. It will, you can make it a secondary capture uh, or an OT, right? It could be SC or OT. Um, and um, uh, you can uh, uh, bring that in automatically as a DICOM object and make it a part of a study with all of the appropriate metadata pre-populated uh, into it. And even more um, interesting, on top of that, the OCR capability lets you detect automatically the MRN, maybe the FIN, right, the financial information number, uh, the, uh, the patient's name, you can search uh, you can, you know, search for keywords. Uh, you could, you know, literally, you know, take a picture of the patient's bracelet and uh, make that searchable and um, uh, and make that uh, a, a subject of query to to get the right patient's jacket uh, lined up. So absolutely, secondary capture workflows 
uh, are very important to us and we let you do that in a very automated fashion and that includes OCR capability. Uh, you, the, the member of the audience also asked about HL7 and that's another yes. Uh, you know, if you have, for example, an HL7 driven workflow where you need to have an order or an ADT message in order to trigger something else, if you have a DICOM image coming in, that in, in and of itself can trigger the creation of an HL7 message or vice versa, right? You, we can receive HL7 and trigger some other either HL7 based or DICOM based event. So yeah, interchangeably, you can do that in the Unifier platform. Um, and because we leverage DICOM web, you're using industry standards to view, store, and query each other. Uh, so HL7 is, uh, is no different for us. We can do that. Looks like another uh, question came. Just uh, before going to that next question, I just want to add the importance of photo. Um, for example, we're working with the cardiology department. And in the cardiology, um, especially the STEMI case, um, ECG is pretty much all you need to do the initial diagnosis if the person is getting a STEMI situation, um, you know, heart attack. Um, so take the photo of the um, EKG and then send it to appropriate people. You can do that. Uh, ultrasound, they use a lot of charts and diagrams. Take them, um, then hang them right next to the ultrasound images. It's going to help radiologists. Dr. Altman, is that correct? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Um, so don't limit to just a photo of skin. Um, take many things. Take a picture of uh, medication bottles that pe people bring in. So you don't have to ask them again. You have all the pictures in there. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, another question that came in, uh, Manabu, and this would probably be a question for you, but it's a pretty simple one. Mm -hmm. Can you query photos by diagnosis? And the answer is, you know, if you've got the correct metadata that's been pre-populated because you have work list uh, associated with a photo, uh, then, uh, you know, absolutely. Now, there, there's two ways to look at it. Either it's an encounter-based um, event or it's a scheduled event. If it's scheduled, then you're going to have some information in the metadata available that can be queried. If it's encounter-based, you may need to actually enter something manually in one of the headers, uh, which you can totally do on the app. Uh, but yeah. yes, you can query photo by diagnosis. Yeah, absolutely. I want to add a few additional points. Um, you know, the ch our chat mechanism um, can be used also um, as a note-taking mechanism. And then we also have a specific additional note um, uh, field too was in our app so if you see something you want to just jot down what it is you can either put as like a chat to yourself or you can add add the uh, diagnosis field uh, you can edit the diagnosis field within our app and you can you can meta search those very very easily just like we have a one single search field in which you can search everything you don't have to have go to specific like patient name field or any sort of stuff like that it's like using google and it's just kind of, you know, kind of modern technology uh, thing. Yeah. So um, I think, uh, you know, we can probably wrap up the webinar soon. I don't think we have any additional questions at this time. But uh, as uh, kind of our closing remarks, first of all, I, I really want to wholeheartedly thank Dr. Altman and uh, Manabu Tokunaga for joining us today and providing some very unique perspective on these new workflows. Uh, and we've been really privileged to be part of the vendor ecosystem that's allowing this, uh, these new workflows to exist. Uh, and just as a, as a closing remark or question to Dr. Altman, uh, what, are, you know, what are some of the next steps? Because right now, you know, what we've done that used to essentially be not possible just you know, a couple of years ago, is obviously now working and in production and it's being rolled out to the rest of the enterprise, not just radiology. Uh, so my role in this company is to make sure that we're always looking to the future and understanding what is the next frontier that Nicholas Children's uh, and other hospitals like Nicholas Children's uh, need us to, um, to go towards. And so what are some of your dreams and hopes for the platform, Dr. Altman, things that you know we don't do yet, but we're clearly on the way to providing. What are some? Don't be bashful. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, and I want to thank both of you. It's really a privilege to work alongside with you. 
Um, part of why I went into medicine is that it's really uh, a scientific endeavor. And I think that the more minds that can look at things from different viewpoints, the better off we are. I think that going forward, I think it will be uh, to carry on uh, what Florent alluded to is that we could easily chat between the other caregivers uh, about the same patient that we're seeing. I think that ultimately it will be done through the phone where we can see all the images that we take in the radiology department alongside of the clinical images and alongside of the different ologies such as the EEG report, such as the intraoperative photos that are taken, such as the PATH report. All of these things will be integrated so that when we're seeing the patients for the first time or a follow-up visit, that all of these things can be seen fairly seamlessly and quickly. Unfortunately, in our current healthcare mode, it's time is of the essence. And I think that things like this will help us to really uh, take care of our patients in a way that we've never had before. Thank you, Dr. Altman. Um, and one uh, final thought is, um, as you can see on our screen, we're going to be at the SIM conference in Colorado. And um, I'll, I'll personally be involved in a Ask Industry uh, panel discussion revolving around the economics of AI. And so, as you know, AI in our industry is almost like an inevitable subject uh, and it presents enormous opportunity with also enormous challenges both for vendors of technology and hospitals that wish to engage more in the the practice of ai and so one question that i have for you dr altman and and for you madabu as well uh, is you know one of the issues i've seen in ai and we're going to talk about that at the sim conference at length is that uh, a lot of the technology created by people uh, without really considering the clinical wishes before they embark on the creation of an AI algorithm. And so you as a physician, Dr. Altman, um, how do you perceive the opportunity to leverage AI? What are some of those things that you would like artificial intelligence or machine learning, really, neural networks, to do for you that would make your life easier? Uh, because we can't always assume that uh, because a PhD candidate is working on an algorithm that is going to be clinically relevant and clinically adoptable and economically viable. And so I always want to hear from a physician uh, who's practicing every day and who's teaching every day, what are some of those things that the industry really should be thinking about in radiology, maybe in pediatrics, uh, that would make your life easier as a physician? That's a... That's a loaded question. <laughs> I think that, I think that um, what we currently do as radiologists every day is we see a bunch of images and we form pretty quickly in our head what we think the diagnosis is. It'd be great to be able to speak into your phone and be able to get 20 current articles of what that diagnosis you think may be. I think AI could lend itself to once you mine what these images in the literature have been shown to look like, uh, there are lots of things that overlap. And if you could speak into your device and you could get all of the differential diagnosis that potentially would look the same from AI intelligence, uh, that's, that's where things are going and whether or not uh, they're going to replace radiologists? Hmm, probably not. But could they make uh, our accurate diagnosis quicker and um, more um, uh, seamlessly interfaced with uh, ease of work to be able to take what our mind thinks about and translate that quickly to evidence-based medicine results? That's what I'm looking for. Give me that. Okay, I'm taking the note. <laughs> yeah, um, um, that's, and we're trying to go toward that, of course, um, as a more of an industry to give these practical use of AI rather than just 
you know, a brainy scientific experiment. Um, and also, also a little bit of a side note, um, our AI team is showing the um, uh, wound AI, uh, uh, current wound automatic wound classification AI result at the sim. So that's on Wednesday morning, I think I'll, uh, if you're interested. Um, yes, you know, that'll uh, be really interesting. Uh, you know, the, the co-founder of WingUMD, the creator of ZenSnap, uh, who's uh, Manabu's partner, Dr. Alami, uh, is a vascular surgeon at Stanford and the, and the VA in the Bay Area. And, um, and so wound classification you know, automatic uh, wound classification is, an, is a really interesting new uh, discipline. Uh, and it will be very interesting to see that in action at the SIM conference. So let's conclude. Uh, very much appreciate everyone's yeah, participation. Thank you. Uh, thank, you for, thank you for our participants um, being here and listening in to our conversation. Uh, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, anytime. We look forward to seeing you at the SIM conference and we will soon be announcing our next webinar uh, and the topic of the next webinar and we'll have uh, another set of really interesting guests uh, to speak with. Thank you everybody. This concludes our webinar today. Have a great Bye. day. Bye everybody.